The last section from chapter 11 that we'll be covering is 11.7. Here we're going to be talking about probabilities with AND and conditional probabilities. In our previous section, we talked about probabilities with OR, and there were two types, mutually exclusive, not mutually exclusive. Same thing's going to happen with AND. When you have two events, A and B, and you look at the probability that they're going to occur, you're going to have either independent events or dependent events. We're going to first look at independent events. So if the two events are independent, then the occurrence of either has no effect on the probability of the other. Let's look at an example of independent events. You toss a coin two times. So this is the sample space that we had before. You could have heads on your first toss, heads on the second, heads, tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. So we're going to consider the particular outcome heads on your first toss, and then we're going to look at heads on the second toss. So it's heads and heads, which we already knew was this first event, HH. Previously, we said, well, the probability of getting heads and heads is we looked at our sample space and we saw that there were four outcomes. Out of those four outcomes, only one of them would be heads on first toss and heads on second toss. There is another way to do this. These are independent events. The probability of getting heads on your second toss has nothing to do with what you got on the first toss of the coin. So you toss the coin, you get heads or tails, doesn't matter what you get. When you toss the coin the second time, what you got the first time you toss the coin has nothing to do with what you're going to get the second time you toss the coin. So they're independent of each other. So what we could do instead, since they are independent events, is just look at the probability of getting heads on one toss. And then since we're going to toss the coin again and we're looking for heads, look at the probability of getting heads on the second toss and do them separately. So if you toss a coin once, the probability of getting heads is 1 half. And then we'll multiply it by the probability of getting heads on the second toss, which would be 1 half. Notice that I also get 1 fourth. It's a longer formula. The advantage to using this second form, independent, and events is that sometimes our sample spaces are very, very large. So writing out all the possible outcomes is not very efficient. Instead, what we would use is we would use the formula in the box for the probability of and as long as they're independent events. Then you would just figure out the probability separately and multiply them. Example one, we have a roulette wheel and it has 38 numbered slots. So there's 38 possible outcomes when you play roulette. So one play has 38 outcomes. So can you imagine doing multiple plays and trying to figure out the sample space with 38 outcomes? Very difficult to write all these down. So instead, we'll see if they're independent events and see if we can use this formula. So we have 38 numbered slots, 18 black, 18 red, and 2 green. During a single play, the wheel is spun and a ball drops. As the wheel slows, the ball will land in one of the numbered slots. We want to find the probability of getting green on two consecutive plays. So that would be the probability of getting green on the first play and playing again, getting green on the second play. So the question is, are these independent events? The answer is yes. What you get the first time you play the roulette wheel has nothing to do with what you get the second time you play the roulette wheel. So you can look at playing the roulette wheel once and seeing what the probability of getting green is. Multiply it by playing it the second time and getting, the pro um, getting it to land on green. So the probability of playing once and having the ball land in the green slot would be there's 38 slots. So that's your sample space. Two of these are green, so two out of 38. 
and you play again, green would be 2 out of 38. Uh, so that's going to be 4 out of 38 times 38, but I think I would rather just reduce the 2 over 38 to 1 over 19. Easier for me to do the math. So it's going to be 1 over 361. So don't forget you're supposed to be reducing all your fractions. In example 2, we want to find the probability that a couple will have four boys in a row. So again, the question is, um, is the gender of the first child, does that have anything to do with the gender of the second child or the third child or the fourth child? And in theory, these are independent events. So I can look at, let's just say capital B for having a boy. I can look at the probability of having a boy and then a boy and then a boy and then a boy and figure them all out separately. And then multiply, oops, sorry. Multiply, multiply, <laughs> not equal. So the probability of having a child as a boy is one half. And then you would just multiply by one half, one half, one half, which would give us one over 16. Example three is going to be a little bit different. We're going to look at independent events with and, but we're also going to bring in some prior concepts that we talked about in probabilities, but also in logic. Example three says if the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane in any single year is five over 19, part A, what is the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane in four consecutive years? So I'm going to hold off on reading parts B and C. Let's look at A. Uh, being hit by a hurricane, I'm going to use a capital H for being hit by a hurricane. Part A. The probability of getting a hurricane in four consecutive years would be hurricane and then hurricane and then hurricane and then hurricane. These are independent events. Having a hurricane one year does not affect the probability of having a hurricane the next year. In theory, I'm not sure if that's actually true. <laughs> so you could look at the probability of a single year being hit by a hurricane and then multiplying that four times. And the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane is uh, 5 over 19. So we're going to multiply that out four times. Or you could do 5 over 19 to the fourth power. In the directions, it says to write the probabilities as fractions and as decimals rounded to three places. If I was to write this as a fraction, it would be 625 over 1, 3, 0, 3, 2, 1. And then uh, my decimal, I'm going to round to three places. So it's 0 0.0047 going to be 0 0.005. Now let's go back to B. What is the probability that South Florida will not be hit by a hurricane in the next four years? So this is not hurricane four years in a row. So the probability of not having a hurricane and then not having a hurricane, not having a hurricane, not having a hurricane in four years. These are independent events. Remember not formula is one minus the probability that we do. So when we look at a single year of not having a hurricane, that's equal to 1 minus the probability that we do have a hurricane, which was 5 over 19. So it's going to be 14 over 19. So this probability 
is going to be 14 over 19 four times. It's all about the words here. Uh, let's see, that should be three, eight, four, one, six over one, three, zero, three, two, one. Uh, in my calculator, I would round that three decimal places it would be 0 0.295. Now part C is a little bit tricky. What is the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane at least once in the next four years? So notice that South Florida could be hit with a hurricane once or twice, three times or even four times. Uh, and it would be really hard for us to figure out all those probabilities because it would be one hurricane or two hurricanes or three hurricanes or four hurricanes. And even when you're looking at one hurricane in the next four years, is it hurricane, not hurricane, not hurricane, not hurricane, or is it not hurricane, hurricane? I mean, the order matters here as well. So instead of doing that, which would be very time consuming and tedious, instead, remember at least once is sum. So when we look at sum, we're going to go back to our quantified statements. Some hurricane in four years. Its negation is no hurricane in four years. Notice that that's what we had in part B. Part B was no hurricane in four years, negation would be some hurricane in four years. So we're saying that B is not going to happen. We're going to use our not formula for probabilities. And we're going to say that it's going to be one minus the probability that we had from part B. Okay, Because we're saying the event in B is not going to happen, so it's a not probability, it's 1 minus. I know this is a little tricky to wrap your head around, so it's going to be 1 minus the probability that it doesn't happen at all, that we have no hurricane in four years, which was 3, 8, 4, 1, 6 over 1, 3, 0, 3, 2, 1. Uh, which would be 91905 over 130321. Now, if I was to write that as a decimal to three places, it should be 0 0.705. It is a little bit odd to kind of wrap your head around part C. So what we're going to do is just look at the box at the bottom here. So probably of an event happening at least once. It's going to be 1 minus the probability that it does not happen, which is what our part B said, no hurricane. And we're saying, ah, we're going to get at least one. So it's 1 minus no hurricane. We'll put that aside and we'll go ahead and talk about and with dependent events. When we talk about dependent events, that just means that the occurrence of one has an effect on the probability of the other. For example, you have a box of 20 assorted chocolates. Five of these chocolates are chocolate covered cherries. Let's say you pick one chocolate and then another. Notice that your first pick, you didn't put that chocolate back in the box and then pick again. You kept it. You picked a chocolate, you kept it, and then you picked another chocolate out of the box. What is the probability that you will pick two chocolate covered cherries? This is an example of dependent events because I'm going to pick, I'm going to keep the chocolate. So now there's only 19 chocolates left in the box. When I take my second pick, my sample size has changed. 
which means the probability of my second pick has also changed. So the occurrence of my first pick has effect on the probability of my second pick. Well, let's look at how we would figure out these probabilities with dependent events. Let's look at the first pick. And we're looking at getting a chocolate covered cherry. So the probability that our first pick is a chocolate covered cherry is there's 20 chocolates in the box. Five of these are chocolate covered cherries. So we're going to assume that our first pick was a chocolate covered cherry. Now we're going to look at our second pick and see if we can get another chocolate covered cherry. However, there's now only 19 chocolates in the box. And of those 19 chocolates, there are only four remaining chocolate covered cherries because my first pick was a chocolate covered cherry. So it's five over 20 times four over 19 and you can do some reduction and all that stuff. Uh, so the reduced fraction should be one over 19. In the box, we have our formula for probability with dependent events. So P, probability of P and B would be figure out the probability of the first. And then when you figure out the probability of the second event, you're assuming the first one has happened. So how does that affect the probability of the second event? In the next two examples, we're going to do something with, with cards. Example four, you're dealt two cards from a standard 52 card deck. Find the probability of getting two kings. So that's the probability of getting a king on your first pick and then a king on your second pick, not pick, I guess, dealt, right? Um, so notice that you're not being dealt a card and then giving it back to, to the dealer. You're keeping that first card. So this is an example of dependent events because if your first card is a king, which out of the 52 cards, there are four kings, and you keep that card, then there is now only 51 cards left in the deck. So the probability that your second card is also a king, well, there's also only three kings remaining because you've held on to that first king, right? You assumed you got a king on your first card. So multiplying and reducing gives me 1 over 221. Another example with cards, you're dealt three cards from a 52 card deck. Find the probability of getting three hearts. So that would be the probability of getting a heart and then a heart and a heart. So it doesn't have to be two events. It could be any number of events. These are three events and they're dependent. If my first card is a heart and I'm holding on to it, then when I'm dealt my second heart, there are now only 51 cards in the deck and there's only 12 hearts. So the probability that the first card is a heart is 52 cards in the deck, 13 hearts in the deck. Now we're assuming that that first card was a heart and we're holding on to it. So now there's only 51 cards left in the deck and there's only 12 hearts left because we already had a heart. Doing it again. For the third card, there are now only 50 cards in the deck and only 11 hearts. Uh, so multiply all of that in my calculator. I have this real neat key in my calculator that will reduce my fractions. This gives me 11 over 850. Now, notice that the probability with dependent events has this 
probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. Well, that is a probability on its own, and that is our conditional probability, which is the last concept we'll talk about in this section, and in fact, this chapter. So again, the conditional probability is using this AND formula for dependent events, but ignoring everything except for this last portion. So we're looking at the probability that B occurs given that A has occurred, which is our conditional probability. The notation that you will see in your book is this P uh, B with this vertical bar, I guess, slash A. So that's the probability of B given A. You'll see given or given that. If you see given or given that in your probability, it's a conditional probability. So that's going to be your hint. Example six, you're dealt one card from a 52 card deck. Part A, find the probability of getting a picture card given that, so again, that's your key phrase, given that the card you were dealt is a spade. So you know that the card you're dealt is a spade, which means that, for one, the given that, it's a conditional probability. It means that our sample space is now reduced. We're not looking at all 52 cards. We're just looking at the spades because that's what we know we have. Oftentimes it's easier to see these conditional probabilities if you re pre replace given that or given by from. So find the probability of getting a picture card from the spades. So since we're only looking at spades and there's 13 spades in the deck, that's our denominator. That's what we're choosing from. So out of those 13 spades, how many of those are picture cards? Well, that would be the jack of spades, the queen of spades, and the king of spades. So three out of 13. Let's look at B. Find the probability of getting a spade given the card you were dealt as a black card. So it didn't say given that, but it says given which again is the hint that this is a conditional probability you can replace given with from. Find the probability of getting a spade from the black cards. How many black cards are in the deck? That would be half the deck, so 26. So I know I'm only choosing from the black cards. How many of those black cards are spades? That would be 13 which I would reduce to one half. Uh, we'll do another one, example seven. We have these eight discs. We have three yellow discs and we have five red discs. So we're just gonna select a disc at random. We wanna find the probability of selecting an even number given that a red disc was selected. Well, maybe I'll do a different color. Too much red in here. So we've got given that, which again is we're choosing from the red disc. So find the probability of selecting an even number from our red disc. So since we're only choosing from the red disc, we have five. If we look at those red discs, how many of those five red discs are even numbers? And that would be the number six and the number eight. So two out of the five. Okay, we're gonna look at our last example, example eight. So this has to do with uh, mammograms, detecting breast cancer and how effective the mammogram is. And when we look at this chart, uh, it's, with 100,000 women who participated in this screening. Of those 100,000 women, 800 had breast cancer, 99,200 did not. So if we look at the first row of this chart, 
Of those 100,000 women, a total of 7,664 tested positive for breast cancer. Of those that tested positive, 720 actually had breast cancer, while 6,944 did not have breast cancer. And let's look at the next row. Those that tested negative for breast cancer. Out of the 100,000 women, 92,336 tested negative. Of those, 92,256 did not have breast cancer. 80 had breast cancer. So we want to find the probability that a woman has a positive mammogram given that she has breast cancer. Okay, so given that is the hint that it's a conditional probability, what we're going to do is just choose from those women that actually have breast cancer. So the, this column here with breast cancer, 800 women total in this screening had breast cancer. Of those 800, how many of those tested positive? And that would be the 720. That reduces to 9 over 10. So you think about that, that's 90%, which is awesome. The screening detected 90% of those women that actually had breast cancer. We'll look at part B and C. In part B, we want to know the probability that a woman has breast cancer, given that, so it's a conditional probability, given that she has a positive mammogram. So we're only choosing with those women that tested positive. In our chart, that would be the 7,664. So out of those 7,664 that tested positive, how many of those actually had breast cancer? And that would be our 720. Reducing, I have 45 over 479. Uh, and that's roughly 9%. I'll just hold that off for now and look at part C. We want to know um, if a woman does not have breast cancer given that, so conditional probability, she has a positive mammogram. So again, we're only looking at those that tested positive, which was the 7,664. Of those 7,664, how many of those women that tested positive did not have breast cancer? It would be 6944. When we reduce that, it's going to be 400 and 34 over 479, or roughly 91%. Oops, that's supposed to be a 91, sorry. So let's think about what this says. In part A, what that says is that if you do have breast cancer, chances are the mammogram will catch it because it catches 90% of breast cancer. Look at parts B and C. 91% of the women that tested positive in part C actually did not have breast cancer. 9% did. So what that's telling us is that the mammogram, although it's great at detecting breast cancer, it also gives a lot of false positive, okay? Which is fine. It's better to have a test that's false positive than false negative because when it does get a false positive, then you would just go back for a follow-up appointment. So that's it for the probabilities. I did want to bring up in this box at the bottom a formula that you might see in your textbook. And this is a formula for conditional probabilities using set notation. So if you see this formula, the P with the B slash A equal to N of B, that weird symbol that's for an intersection over N of A, you can simply ignore it and compute the conditional probabilities as we, as we did in those previous examples. And that's it for chapter 11.